Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26, please. Matthew chapter 26. We will consider verses 36 to 46 this morning in Matthew's gospel. We are entering into the passion of the Christ in a more formal way beginning this morning. We are treading on holy ground. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, speaking about the incarnation, he calls it the mystery of godliness. The mystery of godliness. And indeed, there is much mystery that surrounds the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That God, very God, second person of the triune Godhead would step into space and time, would humble himself by taking to himself human flesh. That by living in full obedience to the law of God, he might then give himself as the savior of the world. These are very, very profound realities, but they raise all kinds of questions and mystery surrounding it. And this morning, we're going to for sure encounter some of that. There are going to be questions that will arise in our minds that the answer to which we just don't know. And we need to, in the words of John Calvin, teach our tongue to say, I do not know. We should speak clearly where we can. We should be circumspect where we must. But we are entering into a very solemn and sacred place beginning this morning. I direct your attention first to John's gospel. You can keep your thumb in Matthew. We'll be back there. But I direct your attention to John's gospel and chapter 12. And verse 27. John's Gospel, chapter 12, and verse 27. The events that John narrates here in John 12 occurred probably Monday, possibly Tuesday of the Passion Week. What I want to draw your attention to in particular is here in verses 27 and 28, where Jesus, uh, speaking of his impending death, says, verse 27, Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Jesus says here, a, a couple of days before the events narrated in Matthew 26, and I'll turn you back there now, just a couple of days earlier, he says, in effect, that I will not pray to be delivered from all that is coming upon me. And yet, when we arrive here in the Garden of Gethsemane, as it's narrated in Matthew 26, we find him praying exactly that. What he says he will not do, cannot do, a couple of days later, he finds himself doing. Why? Why would Jesus, who for so long has evidently calmly faced his own death, now seemed to be less courageous than many others who had gone before him in terms of the, of the martyrs and would follow him among the people of God. What are we to make of that? What are we to make of Jesus praying a prayer, he says, he's not willing to pray. The answer, the answer, I think, lies in the enormity of the task that now lies close at hand. 
as it has come closer and closer and closer upon him, it has pressed down upon him until dread begins to fill his soul. Jesus' death and only Jesus' death could inaugurate the new covenant and with it the full and final redemption of the people of God. But the butcher's bill of sin was terrible indeed. And Jesus must pay that price. This morning here in Matthew 26, verses 36 to 46, we're going to get a glimpse. A glimpse into the intense suffering, into the dread that seized Jesus in the hours leading up to the reality that he would bear the sin of his people, that he would endure the full weight of the wrath of God for all of the sin of all of his people for all of time. And it nearly killed him. It nearly killed him. For an outline this morning, I have just five words. A simple five-word outline, five hooks that we can hang our thoughts on as we go through this that will guide us as we seek to enter into the agony of the garden. Beloved, this is holy ground. We are treading on holy ground. The first word for us is suffering. Suffering. Verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. The scene is Jesus and his 11 disciples, Judas having been previously dismissed to go and to do his dastardly deed. Jesus and the 11 have left the upper room. John 14, verse 31 indicates to us that it was a quick and abrupt departure from the upper room. And there in that home located on the the western hill in the city of Jerusalem, they have left and they have departed. They are are moving now uh, down from the western hill and, uh, and across the city, likely south, just south of the Temple Mount, out through the wall, down the ravine of the Kidron Valley, across the the brook that runs at the base of the valley, and, and back up the flank of the Mount of Olives. It's Passover season. The moon is full. As they cross over the, the brook Kidron, illuminated in the light of the full moon, it is likely that it was running blood red. The Passover season, that 24-hour period where the lambs would be slaughtered, Josephus indicates perhaps as many as 250,000 lambs. That's a lot of blood. They had a very intricate system on the Temple Mount to to flush away the blood, and it would be flushed away and through a a series of conduits and pipes and, and such, it would run down into the Brook Kidron and be carried off down away from the city. So it's likely that the creek bed was running red as they crossed over. On their way to Gethsemane, a little private garden, a little little retreat area, a little oasis on the western flank of the Mount of Olives. Likely a walled garden, perhaps by hedge, maybe by rock wall. Gethsemane itself means garden of the oil press. It was, a, it was a garden area that contained olive trees. It was a favorite for Jesus. 
Undoubtedly, he knew the owner. It would have been a wealthy owner to have such a, a walled enclosure located so close to the walls of the city. Jesus knew that owner who, who evidently let him use the place on more than one occasion. The Gospels indicate that he would go there. Judas knew where to find him there. It was a private retreat, a place to spend the night, a place to pray, a place to be alone. Been to that place. There are olive trees there that they say date back to the time of Christ. They're massive. They're ancient. They're gnarly and hollowed out, but they still produce olives. Upon their arrival there at the garden, Matthew indicates to us that Jesus left eight of his disciples at the gate outside the garden. Wait there, he says. Wait there. You are to, to keep watch, probably to, to ensure his privacy. Jesus knows there's a, there's a clock ticking in his head. Well, they didn't have clocks in those days, so a sand dial, I suppose. But he's keeping track of time. He knows he doesn't have a long time until Judas will show up with the authorities, the soldiers, to make the arrest. But he's not ready. He's not ready yet. So he instructs eight of his disciples to, to, to remain here at the entrance of the garden, to watch, to, keep, to, to protect his privacy to act perhaps as an early, early warning system. And he takes his three closest friends with him into the garden. Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. Peter, James, and John. His three closest friends. And he takes them on into the garden with him. Verse 37. And he began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Up to now, as you read the gospel accounts, Jesus has appeared to keep his emotional state pretty much under wraps. You, you trace through his life and, and you just don't see a lot of highs and lows. But now, as, as death is approaching, as the, as the reality of the, of the weight of the sin bearer, the, the dread of all of that creates a, an emotional distress that, that he says here that he, he feels like he is dying. My soul is deeply grieved, he says, to the point of death. I feel like I'm going to die. I feel like I'm going to die. Matthew records for us that from the cross he will cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The prophet Isaiah, 750 years earlier, records in Isaiah 53 and verses 10 and 11 these words, speaking of this time. The Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. As a result of the anguish of his soul, my servant will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. The anguish of his soul. The writer of the Hebrews in chapter 5 and verse 7, speaking of the same time, says, in the days of his flesh, he, that is Jesus, offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from, and I think it should be translated, out of death. And he was heard because of his piety. He offered up prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears.
And beloved, there is no pain like the pain that comes from fractured relationships. There is nothing that compares. There is nothing more deeply painful, nothing that can make you despair of life more than being separated from someone you love. Not what they do to the body. It's what's done to the heart. And Jesus is facing it head on. Head on. Ever since childhood, he has walked in close intimacy, unhindered fellowship with his father. Luke chapter 2, verse 40. The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. He increased his wisdom as he poured over the word of God, and he knew the grace of God as he grew in his love for his father. Verse 52, at the end of his time there at 12 years of age in the temple where he says, Luke says to us that Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. This 12-year-old who was confounding the, the religious leadership of the nation with his profound insight into the word of God continued to, to grow and draw close to his God. To where Matthew records for us in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17. At Jesus' baptism, when he formally entered into the public ministry, when he began in, in, in a formal way the path that would lead him to the place where he is right now, the Father says, Behold, a voice out of heaven. Behold, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 17, on the Mount of Transfiguration. Again, now a mere matter of months before Gethsemane. Verse 5, and and he was still speaking, Peter speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now this relationship that has never, ever known a moment of disappointment, a moment of of separation or distance, a moment that was not tender and intimate, is now being strained to the point of breaking by all of the weight, the sin of humanity that is to be placed upon the Christ. Beloved, if we don't get this, then we don't get the enormity of our sin. It is our sin that took him at this moment to the very edge of breakdown. And in the midst of his anguish, Jesus asks his friends to pray with him and for him. Verse 38, remain here and keep watch with me. Pray for me. Pray with me. He 
And of course, we know what happened. This is probably as good a place as any, I suppose, to try to address the question that may be on your mind. If the disciples slept, as the text clearly indicates they did, how do they know what he said and what he did there in the garden? To record it for us. How did they know? Well, we can't be sure, of course, but here are a couple of possibilities. One is that they dozed on and off, that it wasn't they just went into a cold, dead sleep and were, you know, were gone for the whole time. Jesus says, could you not keep watch with me for even an hour? That, that indicates that some period of time has gone by, perhaps an hour of prayer, and so it's quite possible that they dozed off and on, and as they were awake, they sort of picked up the gist of his prayer. I mean, after all, the account here in verse 40 is a, is a rather abbreviated kind of account. Or not verse 40, I'm sorry, but, but recorded here, uh, verse, um, uh, verse 39, I'm sorry. Verse 39. I mean, if he's praying for an hour... Either he said the same thing over and over and over and over and over, or they caught the gist of it. So that's certainly a possibility. Another is that Jesus himself revealed to them later, during the 40 days when he, when he walked with them and taught them following his resurrection, that he revealed to them what he prayed and, and, and what happened while they were asleep. That's another possibility. Maybe some combination, I don't know. First word, suffering. The second word is submission. Verse 39, and he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed. There in the garden, he's taken Peter, James, and John into the garden with him. He has, he has asked them to, to, to watch and pray with me, for me. And then he goes a little deeper into the recess of the Pardon me, in the recesses of the garden, Luke 22, verse 41 says it's a stone's throw. So, I don't know, maybe 30 yards, 40 yards? How far can you throw a stone? Jesus proceeds into the inner recesses. He goes beyond them, deeper into the garden to pray. I think we get a, we get a glimpse of the What's going on here when we, when we combine the gospel records? Because they each portray his posture in prayer a little bit differently. Luke 22, verse 41 says he knelt down and prayed. Mark 14, 35 says he fell to the ground and prayed. Matthew 26, 39 says he fell on his face and prayed. And maybe it's all of the above, likely. He began by kneeling, and as the, 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 the grief welled up in his soul and his heart, he fell down to the ground, prostrate, and then later full face to the ground, certainly in keeping with the agony. We can thank the physician Luke, who adds further details for us in Luke 22 and verses 43 and 44. Where he writes, now an angel from heaven appeared to Christ, that is, to him, that is Christ, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. Commentators speak of this. Some say that it's just a reference to, to the sweat falling and it, and it was looked like blood and others, and I'm kind of in that group, say that it was, that it was sweat mixed with blood. There's actually a, a medical condition. It's called hematridrosis. It's the effusion of blood through one's sweat glands. It's rare, 
but it's caused by extreme anguish or, or physical strain. Apparently what happens is, is the subcutaneous capillaries uh, dilate and burst under the intense, the intense stress and strain of the event, and, and the blood actually seeps into the, into the sweat glands and, and flows out through the skin. And so it is blood and sweat mixed together. As he fell on his face, sweating, bleeding, pleading. Verse 39, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Mark reports the Aramaic in Mark 14, 36, that Jesus cried, Abba, Father, Daddy. Daddy, if it is all possible, please, please, spare me the cup of your wrath. Spare me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus is wrestling in prayer. He is, he is struggling in prayer. Body and soul struggling. I think it's really easy to to sort of make Jesus mechanical. Yeah, he was born, he lived, he died. Set his face to Jerusalem like Flint, off he went. Knew he was going to be resurrected, no big deal. Oh, what a gross caricature of the Son of Man. Ultimately, Jesus is able to wrestle through the horror, to find the strength and the comfort that he needs in the sovereign will of God. Again, can you not keep watch with me for an hour? This was not, oh, if possible, please take it away. Oh, not my will, but yours. Next. Next. Not at all. One commentator writes, quote, Jesus' deep personal desire is for God to take away the necessity of his vicarious sacrifice. However, Jesus' greater desire is to see God's will accomplished, and this is where Jesus' victory over himself occurs. Wow. In wrestling with God, in prayer, he gains victory over himself. Suffering, submission, sleepiness, sleepiness, verse 40. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour. It wasn't that long before when Peter made his presumptuous proclamation. Do you remember that? Lord, though all may deny you, I will not deny you. I'm willing to die for you. Never will I desert you. And 
Now, now, perhaps after an hour or so of agonizing prayer, Jesus gets up from his face. His body, his clothes drenched in perspiration, stained brown with the blood. And he finds his three closest friends sleeping. Sleeping. Rather than laboring with him. The heartache must have been great. It must have been great. He says in verse 41, keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Here is Jesus. In the moment of his great agony, the moment of his severe distress, and he responds to his friends, I think with an amazing amount of grace and compassion. Huh? Beloved, they should have stayed awake. They should have stayed awake. The hour is late, to be sure. After midnight by this time. It's been a long day. Lots has happened. There's all kinds of reasons why to fall asleep. But they should have stayed awake. They should have stayed awake. And according to what Jesus says here, right, the spirit is willing, they, they wanted to stay awake. So it's not like they just went into the garden and said, oh, okay, you go pray, we're going to, you know, we'll catch some Z's. See you on the flip side. I think they understand something of the, the, the intensity of the moment. I mean, Luke records, right? Now, Luke wasn't there. So Luke gets it from a witness. I mean, Luke tells us that, right? I interviewed witnesses and so forth. So the intensity of it is all there. And I think they recognize that. And, and then they want to, to pray with him. They want to do the right thing. But they lack the personal strength. To overcome their fatigue. Can you identify? Can you identify? Jesus is compassionate with them here. He's gracious with them. But notice what he says. The remedy is for this. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The remedy for this is for them to redouble their efforts. Redouble your efforts. Yes, you have fallen short. You have messed up. You have failed. You have failed me. You are my closest friends. All that I have, humanly speaking, in the world here, in, in the moment of my greatest distress, my greatest need is you, and yes, you have failed me. Please, try again. Be vigilant in prayer. Notice the present tenses keep watching, keep praying. Continue to fight, continue to wrestle, continue to, to fight off the, the fatigue that is overcoming you.
Not so much for me at this point, but for you. But for you. That you may not enter into temptation, verse 41. The temptation here, I don't believe, is, is that the temptation is, you know, that you're going to not pray for me because I'm asking you to pray for me and you haven't prayed for me. Not like I'm asking. And so try harder so you don't enter into the temptation of falling asleep again and not praying for me. I don't think that's what this is about. The temptation here is now for them. Because it's going to come against you in the next few hours, the organized weight of the Roman government and the Jewish religious authorities, the entire weight of the system is going to come crashing down on you. That's why Jesus prays for them in John 17, right? Father, keep them. I have kept them. Keep them. The temptation to abandon the cause is going to be strong. So pray and keep praying. Notice verse 56 in the same chapter. Into the verse, then all the disciples left him and fled. They left him and fled. Or John's gospel, John chapter 21 and verse 19. That night, Sunday night. So when it was evening on the first day, Excuse me, on the day, on that day, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, they fled. They don't show up again, basically, until they are locked up Sunday night in a room, hiding out for fear of the authorities. Pray and keep Praying because the temptation for you to abandon the cause is, is right at hand. Satan has demanded to sift you, Peter. Beloved, I think we need to see the satanic opposition running in the background of all of this. When Jesus faced Satan in the wilderness for his temptations that inaugurated his public ministry. The Gospels tell us that, that when, Satan, or excuse me, when Jesus prevailed, Satan left him and looked for an opportune time. This is an opportune time. This is an opportune time. Suffering. Suffering. Submission, sleepiness, fourth, solitude, solitude. Verse 42, he went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. Jesus goes away again for a second time, and, he, and he's seeking to steady his heart by remaining vigilant in prayer. He, he is going to do the same thing that he just told them they need to do. This is what you need to do. You need to keep praying, keep watching. And then he goes away to pray and watch himself because temptation is right at hand. He has come to grips with the reality that he must drink the cup of the wrath of God to the very last drop. In his spirit, he, he is now willing to do that. Your will be done, he says. But the flesh is still weak. The flesh is still weak, and it's, it's in need of the spiritual support that only prayer will bring. Beloved, I don't think there's any way to understand this, but, but to see that when Jesus goes away to pray again, he is going away to do battle with his flesh. 
his body, all of the attendant weaknesses of his humanity, not sin, but the attendant weaknesses of the human condition. He needs spiritual support in this moment, and and the means to receive the spiritual support is to pray, is to pray. I think he's he's modeling for them exactly what he is telling them to do. And he returns again. Right? And he finds them sleeping. Verse 43. Again, we're indebted to Luke. In Luke's gospel, Luke 22 and verse 45, it says he found them sleeping from sorrow. He found them sleeping from sorrow, Luke twenty-two forty-five. 45. Perhaps they had wept. Perhaps they too had entered into a, to a period of grief. And they were exhausted by it. And they fell asleep in their exhaustion. And he left them again. Verse 44, he left them again and and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. This is a model. This is intense prayer in in the moment of greatest need over and over and over again. In the solitude of the moment. Beloved, if you are going through something right now, something of such deep emotional pain. You are alone, humanly speaking. Nobody can know the pain that you're feeling. Not your closest friend, not your your spouse, not your, your parent, not your best friend. No one can know the deep grief of your soul but one. Jesus knows. Jesus knows. And more than he just knows, he cares. He cares for you. So while he was completely alone, you are not alone. Though all friends may abandon you, you are not alone. Jesus is with you. He comes back to them finally, number five, in strength. Verse 45, and he came to the disciples and he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? We can't know the tone of his voice. We don't know exactly how he said that. I think it does include a rebuke. But I got to think it was a gentle rebuke. They are still unable to perceive the urgency of the moment, unable to persevere in prayer. But notice how Jesus has changed at this point. When he comes back to them now, his inner turmoil has been resolved. He has fought the fight, the battle won. He now can boldly embrace and endure the injustice and the horror of that which is now to come upon him. Behold, he says, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. He doesn't wait for them to come into the garden to find him. He strides out to meet them. What a transformation. What a transformation.
Jesus died completely alone. Completely alone. And the reason he died completely alone is because he alone is the only possible substitute and sacrifice. To extinguish the righteous wrath of God against the sin of his people. No one else, nothing else but him and him alone. It is his mission. He must see it through to the end. No one can help him with this. He must fortify himself in prayer as the Spirit of God ministers to him, as he recalls the Word of God that he has, that he has sown deeply in his heart for the last 30-plus years. The plan of God, conceived before the foundation of the world, actuated in space and time, is now here. And this plan requires a a once-for-all sacrifice that will shatter the curse of sin, that will deliver man and creation from bondage, slavery to sin. That will put an end to death once and for all. Paul says, He made, he that is God, made him that is Christ, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Beloved, truly, by his stripes, we are healed. All praise, glory, and honor to the Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, as we tread on holy ground, as we seek to try to enter into the reality of the sufferings of Christ, we're stymied by our own finiteness, by our own feeble thinking. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. We thank you that there in the garden he fought the good fight. He wrestled and he won. And that his victory later that same day fulfilled on the cross would be our victory. Our Father, we pray even now, for that one who is here this morning, who has not received by faith the gift of life that the risen Savior offers freely, has yet to understand, has yet to believe, has yet to embrace the reality that the suffering of Christ was for them. May you open their eyes to the truth. Our Father, as we now sing, may your spirit cement the reality of what we have just observed deep in our hearts. Amen.